Hello and welcome to the session on rehabilitation payment and policy landscape. We're going to give you a really brief and high level overview of some future opportunities and challenges. You're going to hear a lot at the whole event about the impact of, of the changes in healthcare from uh, volume to value. So we're going to, we would love to delve into more detail. There's a lot more we could share, um, but we're going to try to be brief and give you a, a, the big picture. So my name is Joy Dahl. I'm uh, the Vice President of Community and Consumer Programs for Sync Health. And at Sync Health, I support initiatives around social determinants of health um, and support our population health team, handle data requests, do a lot of different things. Uh, and then I'll have my colleagues, uh, Julie and Margaret, introduce themselves as they kick off their sessions. But all of us have expertise in a lot of quality and values-based payments work uh, in our careers. So we're excited to share our, our, our experiences with you today. And just really quickly, you all probably know this, but values-based payments and healthcare payments across the spectrum are very diverse. And I really like this table. It's from an article of developing countries that uh, show the different spectrums of payment. And then if you look at the bottom, you see the United States of America. We have incredibly diverse payment models. And so that's why something that works in one environment may not work perfectly in another environment, but that there are opportunities to look at things that do work and, and put them across different spectrums. And so we don't wanna be naive that we aren't going to see differences and mix payments in clinical environments. Uh, and you can see it varies uh, across the world, but just to show the diversity of payments in the United States. And then just showing that again, and there's a spectrum and this says physician payment models, but it impacts all of us from uh, more activity-based to more fixed payments. And again, in the values base, you start to see a movement towards those more fixed payments for the delivery care model that you're working for and working with. And then again, just shows again, the difference of the business models. And so it's really important to understand when you think about the kind of opportunities and challenges around this is what is the payment models you're wherever you work or whoever you're partnering with that they're using, what's the mix, how do they handle that, what are their risk-based contracts, and what's the business models around all of those. And so just, again, you're going to hear more, but just that those, this is really a foundation for this, the challenges and opportunities we're going to talk about. So really briefly, I want to talk about the opportunities and challenges of the interprofessional team. I'm super passionate about teamwork. Healthcare is a team sport. And I really think that we have a lot of opportunity and I've been able to help design and help work with clinical teams being in team-based environments. And this comes out of a, a high value primary care healthcare team. And I want you to look at this picture and notice who's missing. And therapy is missing from this visualization about the importance of teamwork. And teamwork has become the value-based proposition for values-based care. It doesn't work unless the team's collaborating, working together, and there's so much opportunity. So what I would like to show, to say that our opportunity and challenge are the same. We have the opportunity to be in this circle. We are not in that circle. So that's the challenge. We're not always thought of to be part of that team. And how do we step up and become part of the core team that really influences values-based payments and healthcare? Because we know that that's going to impact the delivery and make care more efficient and more cost-effective. So I had the opportunity to be a part of a team where we did this work and we were really focused on interprofessional care, but what really happened as an unintended consequence was the value proposition of values-based payments. And this clinic where we did this work was the first one in our state to move to values-based payments. And we've done several studies, you can look up our work, but we saw that really the, this approach of collaborative care and teamwork really helps you meet the quadruple aim and that's such an opportunity. So improving patient experience, improving uh, and addressing burden burnout and improving your team members experience by working together, really impacting utilization of healthcare and uh, impacting the bottom line, which in a, and what I want to say here about cost is when we started this work, it was fee for service. We had to move to a values-based payment opportunity because we were going to cut costs by working as a team. And so again, it's really sometimes hard to, to strip challenges and opportunities away from each other because they really mold together. That challenge always offers you an opportunity to do something a little bit differently and a little bit unique. 
So that's a really high level, uh, just thinking really briefly about that. And I also wanna challenge us to think as a last opportunity is that we think about healthcare delivery and innovation and the pandemic. We've seen the proliferation of telehealth, health IT, technology. How can we be a part of expanding and recognizing that these other infrastructures give us opportunities to team in different ways and how we can use that to be innovative and creative to make sure that uh, therapy and rehabilitation is part of the healthcare infrastructure that our patients need. All right, I'm gonna pass off to Julie. Hi, my name is Julie Malloy and I'm the Director of Quality at the American Occupational Therapy Association. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the patient-driven payment model in skilled nursing facilities and the patient-driven groupings model in um, home health. Now you're gonna hear much more about this throughout this institute, but just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunity that have presented themselves because of these payment changes. Um, you know, in the past, it was really easy for organizations to see the value in therapy and how it affected um, the bottom line and, of course, um, the care for their clients. Now, with the changes um, from payment for volume of therapy services to uh, more value-based payment models, bundled payment models, et cetera, there's really a shift in these environments, and that does affect the frontline clinicians um, as they're providing care. Um, you know, in the case of skilled nursing facilities, um, questions arose about, you know, individual versus group or concurrent therapy uh, in home health and, and also in skilled nursing facilities. Sometimes it was about the number of visits. So uh, maybe it was a little bit harder to get more visits for a client even when they needed them. Um, so things to think about as um, the payment environment changes um, throughout not just skilled nursing and home health, but throughout healthcare. Um, the other thing that's very important, of course, is quality reporting. Uh, quality reporting is a great idea and it can be very great in uh, helping us show our value, but it's often very burdensome both for individual clinicians as well as for facilities. Uh, the quantity of measures out there, the constantly changing measures, um, and the value-based programs themselves often change, so that can make it challenging uh, to navigate. Um, and each year sometimes these, these measures will change. Uh, you know, for example, um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has several quality reporting programs, and these are listed here on the screen. Quite a few of them, as you can see. Um, you know, there's ones for skilled nursing facility um, quality. There's one for home health quality reporting. But in addition to these, there's also value-based care programs. And again, you'll see, uh, for example, uh, home health care as well as skilled nursing facilities are on this list. So in addition to navigating changes through PDPM and PDGM, practitioners and facilities also have to be aware of the different quality and value reporting programs. So just know there's a lot to think about out there. In order to also show how we're doing um, for therapy services, we need to be able to collect that data and share that data. Um, you know, we can't show the positive outcomes if we don't have the right data elements in our uh, electronic health records or if we're not collecting um, the data that we need. Data interoperability is also a huge topic right now. Uh, once we collect that data, how do we share that with payers, with um, the public, other environments? So being able to collect that data uh, will help us show our value. Um, we'll also help with research, we'll help with uh, moving forward with data interoperability. As in addition, you know, this value-based reporting, uh, it's a unique opportunity for us, as we've mentioned, to, to show our value. Um, but we really need those quality measures to show um, what our outcomes are and also ways to address these th through that interdisciplinary care like uh, Joy was talking about. Um, as CMS is you know, moving forward, they're really talking about digital quality measures and how we collect that data. So um, something else to be aware of, uh, uh, digital quality measures, the plan is to have them in place by 2025, which is really just around the corner. Um, but by harnessing the health data uh, systems and research that many of you are participating in and, and working to improve our data collection and reporting systems, we really do have a chance uh, to show our value um, to the complete healthcare system. And now I'd like to transition to my colleague, Margaret Rogers. Hi, I'm Margaret Rogers. I serve as ASHA's Chief Staff Officer for Science and Research. 
I'm going to be talking today about research and quality reporting. And uh, to begin, um, we're going to be looking at research and data that is needed to support the transition from fee-for-service to value-based reimbursement systems. First, we'll focus on what types of measures and data are needed for what purposes and which audiences, and then how can, we, how can measurement improve quality access and value in healthcare. So uh, the National Quality Forum has an ABCs of measurements, and they've asked questions <clears throat> Excuse me. They've asked questions such as how do patients know if their health care is good, how to pinpoint the steps needed to improve uh, patient outcomes, and how to ensure as employers determine whether they're paying for the best care. Uh, MQF uh, uh, looks at and endorses uh, prospective measures uh, through a process that um, includes evidence-based reviews and other, among other things. And the measures uh, represent uh, really a critical component in the national endeavor to assure all, that all patients have access to appropriate and high quality health care. Um, basically, the measure, measures are developed to improve quality and standardization um, and for public reporting. So providers and the public know what should be, who should be chosen and what organizations want to engage with which providers. Regulation and monitoring, certainly fraud and waste uh, need to be minimized and then to value uh, and provide reimbursement and accountability. So priorities for measurement development uh, by quality domain include clinical care measures, as you can see here, that include outcome measures, system level measures, team-based measures. Uh, safety, uh, medication safety, diagnostic accuracy, care coordination, assessing team-based care, uh, effective ways to use new technologies and effective engagement in interprofessional collaborative practice, patient and caregiver experience, patient reported outcome measures are particularly useful in this domain, and um, uh, also then affordable care uh, looking at measures of overuse. Uh, there's also a move to go beyond uh, value-based purchasing to population health and prevention, not focusing so much on episodes of care, but on the long-term health of the society. Um, and in this uh, regard, you're looking at measures like life expectancy, well-being, et cetera. Um, the merit-based incentive system, which um, came into law in 2017, had four scorable MIPS categories, quality, promoting interoperability, um, improvement activities and cost, and um, measures approved by the National Qu Quality Forum or from an approved qualified clinical data registry can be used for MIPS reporting. Uh, in 2022, uh, the uh, penalty for um, uh, not reporting um, or for being below uh, an, a, a point in the um, a national average would be 9% uh, from what was being paid. The uh, CMS and National Quality Forum uh, used the measurement triad from uh, Donna Bidium, and um, that divides things into outcomes, process, and structures can be seen here in this um, um, uh, graphic, um, and we'll dive a little deeper into this when we talk about how can measurement improve quality access and value in healthcare. Um, so to identify and develop meaningful outcome measures, uh, we want to be equitably evaluating clinician performance for outcome measures, and that requires careful evaluation of associated patient risk factors, age and comorbidity. It's been a challenge because of limited sample size and data availability to constrain the development of risk-adjusted models, uh, but a development of a valid risk adjustment model is a very high priority. Uh, we need to have this information so that we can build uh, predictive models uh, to look at the rehab potential of an individual patient based on historical data from similar patients uh, and to indicate which approach to intervention is likely to be most effective for a given patient in a given circumstance and, of course, to predict the resources that will be required to meet a goal. There are four essential elements, uh, and there is research uh, 
a massive research within each of these boxes, uh, but they, uh, as an overview to estimate value and predict outcomes um, and uh, learning for quality improvement. So we need very carefully selected case mix data. And of course, you can see this as being very important because if we're tying reimbursement to uh, patient um, uh, diagnostic category, uh, DRGs in this case, or some version thereof, uh, we're certainly going to want to be able to separate those with um, a lot of uh, cognitive involvement from those that don't. That would fall under a case mix variable. Uh, we also want to be able to look at the services and the dosage and the intensity. Uh, we also want to look at outcomes across uh, activity impairments, participation, as well as contextual factors of the international classification of a functioning, um, and a last, of course, uh, cost. So the big question really is to support value-based pur purchasing, what works best for whom, under which circumstances. And within this one slide, uh, there's hundreds of, of, of careers of research. Uh, if we look at the what, we have to manualize the treatments that are being given if they're behavioral, not a pill, for instance. Look at the treatment fidelity and its ability to be implemented in a clinical setting to identify the active and essential uh, ingredients, mechanisms of action, when we're asking if it works, is it a valid outcome measure? And at what phase of intervention is it, is it, is it working? And a cost benefit analysis. Uh, we need to define success. Uh, that's whose perspective that is. That comes into talking with people who have the condition as well as clinicians delivering the services. And that all leads to comparative effectiveness research. Uh, and when we think about for whom, that's where we get back into the case mix, risk adjusted data, diagnostic precision, and also looking at uh, not just the severity of a condition, but what other conditions, the complexity and comorbidities. And under what circumstances, one of the things driving CMS um, uh, vision for, for a, a learning healthcare system or the Institute of Medicine um, has been that uh, there's just different um, uh, 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 results from different care settings. So when we look at how we can improve, uh, how measurement can improve quality of life, we, we, we really look toward a learning systems, a learning healthcare system can generate and then also apply best evidence and the collaborative healthcare choices. And the hope was by 2020 that 90% of clinical decisions would be supported by this sort of information. And um, it's moving in that direction, clearly not there yet. Learning systems uh, will determine what works best for whom in which circumstances and what the value is uh, for given uh, services. Um, and uh, this is a very iterative system and it will um, uh, ideally reduce unwarranted practice variation, waste, and pr promote continuous quality improvement, improved outcomes, and improved value. Uh, and I will leave you with an age-old thought from Lord Kelvin or Peter Drucker, uh, you can't manage or improve what you can't measure. <laughs>